Let's get a little bit more on the movement that we're seeing in chips. NVIDIA among the names taking a hit on reports that the Biden administration is considering new restrictions on chip exports to China. We want to bring in Phil Orlando, chief equity strategist at Federated Hermes. Phil, it's good to see you here from your perspective, this crackdown here that maybe could be coming or further crackdown, I should say, on some of the exports uh, from U.S. companies to China when it comes to chips. How big of a headwind, a challenge do you see this being for the industry at large? Well, understand that what the Biden administration is trying to do, I think, is look forward uh, and consider national security as an issue. Do you want uh, your chief competitors like like China, like Russia, et cetera, uh, to have uh, these very high powerful AI chips. Now, as we as we take that back and look at from a market perspective, uh, Nvidia, just as an example, the stock's done phenomenally well uh, as a result of this artificial intelligence FOMO that's been going on over the last uh, eight months or so. The stock has literally quadrupled from a little over $100 uh, a share to about $440 a share over the last eight months. From a valuation perspective, the stock's now selling at uh, you know north of about 30 times uh, revenues and about 130 times earnings. So uh, you, you've got some frothy valuation levels. So if sentiment suddenly gets hit because there's concern about whether the Biden administration is going to put any restrictions on the ability of these companies to export their their goods, uh, then those valuation levels could come in. There's plenty of profits to take off the table. Uh, so uh, it might an air pocket be coming if that's the direction the Biden administration wants to go? Certainly, that's something you can't rule out. Phil, sticking with chips here, uh, how much of a headwind is all of this, all, all of these restrictions, is it for the Chinese government there? And also, when we think about AI, it's the next big thing, uh, requires tons of resources and computing power. If the U.S. Uh, amps the arms race against China, at what point do they throw in the towel or do something a little bit more drastic than just tit-for-tat retaliations? Well, you can't rule out the fact that you've got uh, the two greatest economies of the world, and, and if China doesn't like uh, the direction that we're taking this discussion, we used to say that they don't counter with something that's even more draconian. Now, speculation is that uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen uh, is heading over to China to meet with President Xi for a summit uh, to try to smooth things over next month. Uh, so it's expected that the Biden administration won't put forth their formal plans until after uh, Secretary Yellen's trip. They don't want to uh, muddy the waters even more. Uh, but, uh, I mean, you can certainly see how the tea leaves are, are, uh, are shaping up here. I think China has got to be prepared for some uh, some uh, draconian activity out of the Biden administration. And who's to say that they don't counter with something that's even worse? And what's the impact going to be on, on you know, technology companies generally here in the United States that, that have done really, really well uh, over the last 18, uh, the last eight months with this, this huge rally in, in growth stocks? Yeah, and Phil, going off that massive rally that we've seen in growth stocks, you mentioned the valuation of NVIDIA, the massive run-up that we've seen in that stock since the start of the year. We've started to see some of the participation widen out just a bit. There was so much focus on that narrow market breadth up until about a couple of weeks. So, I mean, we're still talking about it. But when we talk about the next leg higher, the leadership, where do you see that coming from? Well, you know, you made a great point, Shauna. And as we look at the market, you know, over the course of the last eight months, even just so far this year, you know, uh, the, the S&P 500 as a whole has had a pretty good run, all right? You're up about 15% or so. But the, 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 the big eight technology names, you know, NVIDIA, Microsoft, Apple, those, you know, the obvious names, they're up more than 50%. If you strip those eight names out of the rest of the S&P 500, the other 492 names are, are up like 2 or 3%. So what we would expect to see over you know, the next couple of quarters is, as you said, sort of a reversion of the mean. The technology stocks may give up some of those gains. They're frothy, to be sure. Uh, you've got a lot of value-oriented areas, like, like energy, for example. Tech stocks in general are up 40% first part of the year. Energy stocks are down 10%. You've got a 50% spread in valuation. The energy stocks are selling at you know, 10 times earnings. 
They've got uh, dividend yields that are, you know, three, four, five percent, you know, double or more versus the S and P 500. So we would expect to see sort of a reversion to the mean. The bad stocks doing better. The the really good performing stocks uh, sort of giving up some of those gains. I want to ask you about the Fed because we had Jerome Powell saying earlier this morning that uh, two consecutive rate hikes are not off the table, and that's after pausing at the last meeting. So what happens if we get another rate hike, another two rate hikes? Um, at what point does this become, uh, does this require a repricing in the bond market of investor expectations? Because we've seen rate cuts now get pushed out to 2025 from a number, uh, by a number of analysts. Well, I think that's exactly right. And, and the bond market, in our view, has had it right throughout. You look at some of the key inversion metrics that, that we look at at Federated Hermes, uh, the relationship between the Fed funds rate and benchmark tens, uh, two-year treasuries and 10-year treasuries, three-month treasuries and 10-year treasuries. All of those metrics are significantly inverted and are telling us that we should be expecting a recession in the United States, not, not today or tomorrow, but but. Uh, perhaps a year from now. And then you've got some of the economic metrics. The leading economic indicators have been negative 14 months in a row. The ISM manufacturing index has been below the critical 50 contraction level seven months in a row. All of these things have been excellent leading indicators to tell you that the economy is slowing and, and perhaps slowing in a recession when you go back and study the last 50, 75 years worth of data. So when the chairman of the Federal Reserve comes out and tells you we, we are fully recognize that nominal headline inflation has come down sharply over the last year, but, but core inflation, which is the metric that we're really paying attention to, has been very, very sticky and it may take another two or three years before it gets to our uh, target level. And therefore, you could fully expect that we're going to tighten policy a few more times in the second half of this year. You've got to recognize that when you look at something like a Phillips curve analysis, for example, when you're trying to bring inflation down, you're raising interest rates to do that. The, the rate of unemployment is likely to move up. The, the pace of economic growth is likely to slow. And, and I think that the equity market you know, to a significant degree has been whistling past the graveyard the last six months. And I think there needs to be a reversion to the mean with stocks as well. Well, Phil, what do you think the reaction will be in the equity market more specifically if we do see a recession? Because we've been talking about the threat of recession now for quite some time. And to your point, investors haven't seemed to care too much. They, they're not too worried about it. Well, again, because it's far off. I mean, yeah. we're calling for a slowdown in the economy. Maybe it's recession, but it's not gonna to be tomorrow. It's probably going to be something next year. So equity markets right now are sort of thinking, well, maybe we dodged the bullet. Maybe, you know, it's going to be a rocky landing or a soft landing or maybe no landing at all. Maybe the economy just reaccelerates and, and we, you know, we dodge that bullet completely. Uh, we're, we're a little more cautious at Federated Hermes. We're still considering the possibility that we go into recession perhaps six months from now or a year from now. And as a result, we're, we're still keeping the defense on the field. Uh, you know, we've got some growth, some technology, but we're underweight those areas. We're more overweight, the more defensive cheaper, higher, uh, lower beta, higher dividend yielding areas, anticipating that, you know, maybe we hit an air pocket over the next couple of quarters because the realization of an impending recession, may, maybe that risk becomes, uh, uh, you know, clearer to investors later this year. And Phil, all of this is happening not in a vacuum in the U.S., but we have a number of central banks all over the world doing Different things. Some are raising, some are uh, raising interest rates, some are lowering uh, different strategies, different goals. And it's been a long time since we've seen all the central banks kind of acting in unison. What are the dynamics here? And um, do you see the central banks getting back to a place where finally everyone seems to be on board marching in the same direction? So I, I might take a slightly different tone there that mm -hmm. certainly uh, Europe uh, is is tightening because of the inflation problem. Uh, even though the United States, our central bank, uh, paused at the June 14th meeting, I still think the bias is hawkish and higher here. You know, as as Bernanke, uh, as Bernanke, as Powell said this morning, uh, we may very well see two more you know quarter point rate hikes uh, in the second half of this year because of this divergence 
between headline and core inflation. The only central bank that has taken a different tack is, is China, the PBOC. And the reason for that is the economic growth that they've seen coming out of uh, eliminating their self-imposed COVID lockdowns, you know, late last year, beginning of this year. I think they expected to see much more robust economic growth uh, and that hasn't happened. They're starting to get nervous now. So I think you're going to see more aggressive fiscal and monetary policy coming out of China to try to boost their economic growth prospects and get GDP back to, you know, maybe a 5% run rate by the end of this year, maybe something in the 6 to 8% neighborhood by the end of next year. I think the rest of the world, you know, the, the Eurozone, uh, the UK, Japan, the United States, we're still significantly concerned about how sticky, how persistent core inflation is. And as a result, that suggests tighter monetary policy out of those central banks, uh, which is likely to slow economic growth and increase the rate of unemployment, you know, as they're continuing this policy. Phil, let's talk about how to play all this. You mentioned the fact that you're seeing some opportunity in some of the names that haven't exactly participated in the rally that we've seen in the first half of the year. Energy is one of the sectors that certainly has not participated in a lot of this enthusiasm. Is there a buying opportunity there? Yeah, I really think so, uh, both from a crude oil standpoint and from a market standpoint. We touched upon the market a moment ago. In the first half of the year, uh, the technology stocks, growth stocks, have done phenomenally well. They're up 40%. Energy stocks are down 10 So you've got a 50% valuation imbalance just in the last six months between how these groups have performed. And, and as I mentioned, from a valuation standpoint, uh, you've got single-digit PEs in energy, and uh, you've got uh, dividend yields that are double the broad market. From a crude oil standpoint, you're in sort of a mid-60 to mid-80 kind of a trading range on WTI. We're only a couple of dollars off the bottom end of that range. Um, and and let's see how uh, the fundamentals play out over you know the next six to 12 months. OPEC has cut production by about four and a half million barrels a day. Uh, we've still got to refill you know 370 million or so barrels of oil into the strategic petroleum reserve. Uh, we've just passed, we've gotten into the summer now, summer driving season, uh, heat, air conditioning season. We've got an El Nino effect. What, what does that do to the risk of, of the hurricane season? Might there be any damage to refining capacity in the Gulf of Mexico? There, there's any number of things that could reduce uh, the supply, increase the demand, force prices higher you know, over the course of the next six months or so, uh, and prices are coming off of very low base. So mm -hmm. given our contrarian nature here, you know, I, I think uh, energy doesn't look like a bad bet. Uh, it's cheap and and uh, the risk in, in crude prices, in our view, appears to be higher. Yeah, let me ask you about OPEC, because we had the Saudis unilaterally cut, uh, I believe it was a million barrels per day, and that was to shore up the price of oil. That was about a month ago. And now we see Russia, there is an attempted coup, maybe call it what you will. Um, maybe the power structure there is in danger. Russians haven't been really been playing that, that much ball. They haven't been cutting their production in line with the rest of OPEC plus, which maybe it's only the Saudis anyway. Just wondering how those dynamics shape your view of the, of the oil market. Well, it's potentially significant because the, the three major energy producers in the world are Russia, Saudi Arabia, and the United States. Uh, OPEC Plus has cut their production by 4.66 million barrels a day, and they plan on keeping those cuts in place through the end of next year. Uh, the Saudis step forward and announced they're going to part of that 4.66 million barrels, they have a million barrels of it. The Russians have cut a half a million barrels. But to your point, given the political instability that's going on in Russia right now, potential coup, whatever, does that represent some instability in the energy production industry within Russia? That's a very important industry for them. So if their problems result in them at least temporarily reducing their production given incremental demand you know summer driving season heat need for more air conditioning uh disruption with production capacity due to hurricane season any anything of that nature that could create an, a temporary imbalance which would push the the prices of energy higher, theoretically the prices of energy stocks higher as well 
So, I mean, the, the the sort of wild cards that we're talking about, I mean, we don't have any knowledge of whether or not it's going to be a bad hurricane season or whether or not we're going to have a, a, an extraordinarily hot summer or whether or not Russia is going to have, uh, you know, some sort of a political coup. But the risk of those things suggests that given the price of crude oil being as low as it is, we could see crude oil move higher and, and that could certainly boost the prospects of energy stocks, at least in the near term. Lots of moving parts there. I'd forgotten we have potentially a southern oscillation to deal with in the form of El Nino. We have to leave it there. Really appreciate all of your insights. Phil Orlando, Chief Equity Strategist at Federated Hermes. Thank you.